Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Lincoln Carr and also to have him as a guest. Uh, Lincoln has a broad range of theoretical interests covering many disciplines, uh, using an even balance of analytical and numerical methods and often working closely with experimentalists. Subjects he's worked on include entangled quantum dynamics, quantum phase transitions and ultra cold quantum gases, artificial lattice systems from optical lattices to graphene to millimeter waves, solitons, vortices, chaos, fractals, and other nonlinear phenomena in nonlinear Schrodinger and nonlinear Dirac equations as realized in Bose-Einstein condensates, uh, spin waves and ferromagnetic thin films and optics, and the quark gluon plasma at CERN and RHIC, and a variety of topics in mathematical physics and the physics of complex systems. He uh, received his uh, uh, bachelor's from uh, University of California, Berkeley, and his master's and PhD from uh, uh, University of Washington, and he has received a, a number of uh, significant recognitions, uh, including being a distinguished international fellow of the National Science Foundation, um, National Science Foundation uh, Career Award, Colorado School of Mines Research Excellence Award, and among many others. Um, and also uh, he's, he's presently serving as a Jefferson Fellow in, in Washington. But uh, it's a real pleasure to have you um, uh, visit us and we look forward to your presentation, Lincoln. Thank you. Yes, yeah, an honor to be here. I, I love seeing the kind of quantum program you're building here. Uh, that's very interdisciplinary in nature. I think it's very much what the country needs. And uh, it's my honor to present some of my work for all of you. Uh, I'm counting on you for some hard questions during my talk. So please be preparing those questions for me. I love to learn when I present as much as I like to teach you what I know. So, okay. Uh, today I will talk about entangled quantum cellular automata, physical complexity and Goldilocks rules. And you see in the upper corner, we have a picture of Goldilocks. Uh, who is dealing with the bears and trying to find the spot that's just right to sleep and eat and sit. Um, I come out of the quantum engineering program at the Colorado School of Mines. So again, I'm excited about the program that you're all creating here. Uh, and this is work I've done in collaboration with many uh, students and now faculty over the years, uh, and recently um, with both NREL and Google Quantum AI on the project I'll get to at the very end. Okay, so hopefully we'll have time, but just in case, anything I show you theoretically has actually been demonstrated experimentally, and that's the part I'll get to at the end. So this, this is all things now in the real world. Right, so um, we were talking about Goldilocks and her adventures with the bears, uh, and we're working forward into what we'll be uh, discussing today in terms of quantum uh, primacy or advantage or supremacy or beyond classical or whatever you would like to call it, which is part of the goal of this talk. So I want to remind you, that this is one of the goals of quantum computing for a quantum computer to outcompute in some fashion a classical computer. So I would like to recall for the general audience that building blocks of present quantum computing, which involve qubits, okay, qubits are uh, a generalization of binary logic to quantum logic. They involve nothing more than two angles. You can think of them as being on a sphere, the longitude and the latitude on that sphere, and those two angles interpolate between the poles of zero and one are true and false. It's a very nice logical system with certain advantages. Uh, the second building block of present quantum computing is entanglement. I like to call it the mega yada yada. The mega yada yada happens to be 10 to the 54, which is 10,000 times the number of atoms in the Earth, 10 to the 50. So if we took 10,000 Earths and we uh, deconstructed them into all their constituents atoms and made them all classical bits, right, we could outcompute that in some fashion for certain algorithms with 180 quantum bits. It's a fun little calculation to run. Uh, involving some conversion between logs. And uh, that's an example of the power of multiplication. I mean, recently been through the pandemic, I think we all understand the power of multiplication. That's how disease spreads. Um, so multiplicative spaces are powerful and quantum mechanics works with this multiplicative space called Hilbert space involving entanglement in that space. We can create states within those spaces via quantum gates, which is for example, the quantum version of not and et cetera that the general audience may know from their courses. Very importantly for quantum computers, uh, the present model as a whole is to avoid decoherence. Quantum states are fragile. Once they interact with the environment, they become entangled with the environment. They're no longer entangled with each other in terms of the system. And you have you know, many problems with quantum computation. Okay, so here is this sphere I was talking about, the zero and the one, it's called the block sphere. Um, so it's fun to play around with mathematically. And here to remind you is that 10 to the 50 atoms in the earth, it's a nice round number. And this is the mega yada yada. Okay, so in 2019, uh, Google Quantum AI, my collaborator on the last part of this project, uh, demonstrated something that was at the time beyond classical, no longer is, 
but let's say it's still in the direction of showing scaling beyond classical involving 53 qubits. So not 180, but still a lot. Uh, 1,113 one qubit gates, 432 qubit gates. It had um, very high fidelity, meaning low decoherence, uh, of, you know, about a 0.2% sort of uh, error or problem induced on average uh, when we do these kinds of operations. But even with that extremely high quality of qubits, the circuit depth was 20. There are 20 layers to the circuit total once we got to you know, 53 qubits. So you couldn't go very far. It happens for random states. That's enough layers of the circuit to do something. But for most calculations, it's not enough. So what do we do uh, with this problem of decoherence? OK, so from the engineering perspective, how can we create more robust high depth quantum circuits. And the answer I want to present today is to use nature's strategy. So nature's strategy very often is to take advantage of the natural robustness inherent in complexity to do lots of different things. And you will find complexity in many different physical systems uh, out of nature from DNA uh, to the brain to ecosystems, also in artificial systems, which are actually not so artificial, our social systems, our economic system, our political system, et cetera. This is mathematically quantifiable. I'll give you a little bit of sense to mathematics throughout this talk, but I'll keep this talk light on math. Okay, so what is complexity? All right, well, the first thing to keep in mind is um, hopefully you know that chaos does not mean noisy, right? Chaos is uh, you know, apparent randomness with hidden order. In the same sense, you know, complexity does not mean complicated, right? So that's the first thing to understand. In fact, complex systems can be quite simple in their construction. Uh, we have a precise notion of chaos. It's something that's developed over my lifetime. I'm, I'm born in the early 70s. I think Robert May's uh, famous paper on logistic math with chaos came out in the early 70s. And in my lifetime, it's become a totally established and understood field. Uh, we're doing that now with complexity since the late 90s. OK, so if you get nothing else out of this talk, <laughs> you should get out that physical complexity is not being complicated. Okay. Uh, so the common idea of complexity you find in computer science is uh, algorithmic uh, or Kolmogorov complexity. And that's essentially can be couched in the, an idea of what is the complexity of the number. So for example, um, if we think about pi, right? Pi is a symbol, but pi is made up of an infinite bit string. And if I wanted to write down each of those uh, entries in this, in this, you know, this uh, bit string, uh, then, you know, it would take me forever and it would involve, you know, as, as big of a program as the number of bits I want to write out in some fashion. On the other hand, you know, already in 1593, you know, the very first uh, product series, right, infinite product is used to approximate pi. And so in fact, they're quite simple algorithms that produce pi, pi and pi has low algorithmic complexity because an algorithm can generate pi. And that algorithm quantifies sort of the code, the length of code that you need to create the number of pi, okay? So this definition of complexity is not really about complexity. It's actually about, um, you know, computability or efficiency. Okay, so from my perspective, even though it's called computational complexity, I understand that's established language, I want to distinguish that from physical complexity. Those are, those are two different things. The overlap between them is a very deep and abiding question. For example, you know, can you re represent the brain on a computer would be a classic question along those lines. Okay, so what is complexity? Well, we're looking for the origins of physical complexity. And we know that complexity often involves emergence and often involves trade-offs. So from a fundamental science perspective, complexity characterizes a system of multiple individuals, which may interact in many ways, resulting in collective group behaviors. Okay, so complex systems balance these trade-offs. Uh, examples of complex systems are, you know, individuals, humans, who interact via friendships, and out of that develop a social network, and Facebook, and LinkedIn, and whatnot. Okay, uh, ants, through chemical signaling, they do an anthill, neurons, through synaptic firing, Somehow give rise to consciousness. That's considered one of the outstanding problems in the sciences, understanding that problem. Uh, you know, if you're interested in, in, in engineering and, and, and physics, uh, you know, transistors uh, through a series of conductive wires give rise to a CPU. Uh, you know, uh, firms, if you're in economics, through supply and demand, give rise to price, you know, et cetera. So those kinds of systems are complex systems. Okay, so uh, Goldilocks is, as I say, this idea of trade-off where you um, have, for example, commonly a trade-off between robustness and fragility in the process of evolution. There are wonderful papers on these subjects, big reviews that I'll, I'll point you to if you like at the end of the talk. The kind of trade-off I'm gonna consider today is extremely simple and involves a very nice physical symmetry, which for me and my origin of this, this makes me very happy. Okay, so um, to give you an idea of uh, what we mean by a complex system, to be very concrete, I'm going to give a fairly simple example 
Uh, at the top of each uh, screen, I will, I will put uh, some little Mathematica code for your students who may enjoy Mathematica, and then they can actually reproduce this result themselves. So I encourage students to pull uh, any uh, image they like off the internet, okay? And um, uh, so this is my student, Michael Wall, who came with this example, who eventually won the Metropolis Award. And uh, his choice of an image, uh, since he was working on entanglement, was a, a two-headed turtle, which he felt well represented entanglement. So this is an image off the internet. It's uh, been cast into, into black and white. And as you may be aware, an image uh, on the internet is in fact a matrix, right? Each pixel in the matrix has a value, okay? So we take that image, uh, uh, we go ahead and we um, do singular value decomposition, uh, which for the general audience who may or may not be familiar, it's exactly like diagonalization, except you can do it on every matrix, not only some matrices. But it's the same sort of thing, you get some diagonal values that you, know, you can cascade from biggest to smallest and they represent what's happening in the matrix. And so if I make a plot um, of singular values, which I'm doing here with this little mathematical code, you, know, you can see that there are let me go ahead and get a laser pointer I can use here. This will allow me to do this. Okay. Uh, there are some singular values up here that are, that are quite large. And then on a log scale, they really taper off. Okay. So that's really what this turtle looks like. And you can ask, well, um, you know, what does it mean if I retain only some of the singular values? What would I see? Well, let's try doing that. So first I'm gonna retain one. Okay. And I'm gonna call the number of singular values I retain high. So if chi is equal to one, I see a very nice uh, scotch blend, right? Uh, what about five? Well, just five singular values, right? Out of the 300 or so in this image, I, I'm already starting to see a two-headed turtle emerge. In fact, when I go to 10, it gets better. By the time I get to 25, I'm pretty sure uh, if any of us take our glasses off, we won't know the difference between you know, this and 300. And by the time I get to 50, you know, I can't tell the difference between 50 and 300. And there's 100, see, it's almost exactly the same because it's just a tiny modification in the noise. Okay, so in fact, for any structured image like this, what I would call a complex image, we only need a small fraction of the total singular values. That is one of the definitions of complexity, but it has high information compressibility. Notice how that's the opposite of computational complexity, which would say, oh, we should not have compressibility for something to be complex. So physical complexity has this characteristic. Okay. If you want to understand how this is different from a random image, here is a random image. So I just took you know, a, a white noise. I, I went ahead and did exact, exactly the same singular value decomposition. You can see it's quite flat comparatively. So here are random pixels. And loosely speaking, this is the kind of thing that Google was looking at, a quantum version of this in 2019. Okay. And what I'm gonna tell you about today is what I did with Google in 2021, which is a sort of two-headed turtle, which I'll get into. Okay. And, and uh, you can see how complexity is quite different in terms of compressibility, physical complexity from a random state. Now, I'm gonna pause here at the, at the, you know, with this introduction and ask if there are any questions because now I'm gonna start launching into quantum set or automata and what the two-headed turtle will really be. Okay, well, let's go ahead and go forward. I encourage people to interrupt as they like. I personally like that myself. I like the conversation, so feel free to ask. Okay, so what is the quantum version of physical complexity? I've given you my analogy. I've given you some mathematical measures you can work with. Those of you who do computation will be familiar with what I just did. Um, by the way, singular value decomposition is the major technique I use in my own compression algorithms on quantum states called tensor networks. So it's actually a pretty reasonable thing to talk about in the quantum context. So if you think about um, the connectivity between different airports, this is the flight paths between different or flight connectivity between different airports around the world. Um, you can quantify that, and you quantify that with what are called complex networks. Uh, for those of you in computer science, this is graph theory. So you have nodes and links. You can contrast a complex network to a trivial network, which would be, for example, a lattice, like we have in solid state physics, or a random graph, uh, like we would have you know, quite often, for example, in nuclear physics. Um, so things like the internet, ecologies, uh, friendship networks, or the monkey sphere, they, they tend to have complex structure like this, in particular, a kind of network that you find often out in nature is the small world network, which says that the path between any two nodes grows like the log of the total number of nodes. And if you think about airport networks, you're gonna understand right away, it's gotta be small world. You don't wanna have to go, you know, change flights 500 times, right? To get from Raleigh to Shanghai. You know, you wanna go, you know, Raleigh to maybe DC, DC to Shanghai, or Raleigh to, I don't know, uh, you know, Fort Lauderdale, or. Houston or wherever you go, however you guys get, I don't know how you get to Shanghai, maybe you go over to Europe first, but okay. So the idea is that, um, you know, uh, you have a few nodes that are highly connected, right? 
And that takes care of this problem of connectivity and nature finds the solution all the time. Uh, from a mathematical point of view, connect connectivity has replaced space-time as the most fundamental idea in this kind of algorithm. That's very strange for those of us that love PDEs. I grew up in PDEs. And uh, really thinking about transitioning from PDEs into connectivity and topology, that's part of the quantum problem, actually. And so that's an interesting part of the quantum, quantum problem that's been underexplored. OK, so you can build these on quantum computers and quantum simulators, right? So I remind you that quantum computers are uh, discrete time or pulsed analog. Uh, quantum simulators tend to be continuous time. There are over 300 working quantum simulators, 10 plus architectures, and, and we have a roadmap in PureX Quantum. I'm sorry, somehow the date fell off there, but I think that's in 2021. Uh, there's also a roadmap there on quantum computing stack, uh, which actually your colleague Chris Monroe uh, up, up the road here uh, led, and also on the Interconnects, and I encourage you to have a look at those. Okay, so there are lots of ways to build these things, and today I will talk about doing them on a digital quantum computer, but I'm gonna let you know they can be built on other machines too. So, physical complexity involves structural connectivity in complex networks. The individuals are network nodes, the interactions are network links, and the group behavior is the network measure. And I'll get into the measures. So one example of measure is the node structure. That's just like density. As a practical matter, as you can see, it involves just summing over uh, one index in this matrix called the adjacency matrix. Um, the node strength is something we would use to quantify, for example, a food web. Have lots of things eat lots of other things. That would be an efficient food web. Okay. Uh, we can talk about uh, disparity, which is really about the structural backbone of such a complex network. Um, and is, again, pretty simple mathematical operations. I have undergraduates do this work all the time, freshmen, sophomores, and do this in engineering. Okay. And, uh, and then clustering, which is really saying, uh, is the friend of my friend also my friend? So you're looking for closed triangles, and in particular, it's the ratio of the number of closed triangles over the total number of triangles that they have, okay? Uh, and so clustering, you know, it's only involving, a, on average, a, a trace of this matrix Q. So all these things are simple operations, you know, any, any undergraduate can do. So this is just to give you a sense that, um, you know, these kinds of networks are out in nature. Uh, you know, we have the food networks here. Uh, this is an example of, you know, a metabolic network, and then uh, this is uh, using clustering to identify statistically kind of different communities in a, in a data set. Okay, so I'm going to use uh, cellular automata. Now, I should say that cellular automata is what Feynman was thinking about when he gave his original speech on quantum computing and inspired the field. If you read this speech carefully, you'll see that he was writing it at a time when cellular automata were very popular. People thought that cellular automata would actually reproduce all of known physics, and that bothered Feynman because he said, wait a minute, it scales wrong. So very, very good insight about that. And it turns out neither cellular automata nor quantum cellular automata reproduce all of classical nor quantum physics, except by a very bad simulation. So that plan did not work out. However, cellular automata and quantum cellular automata do do many other things. And so today I'll tell you about one of the things that quantum cellular automata does for us and how it improves the quantum computing situation. Any questions about that for those of you who may be familiar with the history of cellular automata? I often have people in the audience who, you know, do this in their free time every evening, so you're talking about it's, it's sort of obsessive and actually beautiful and fun area. By the way, if you're ever teaching high school students, one of the great ways to get them to coding is to show them cellular automata. Usually they see that and they just can't stop coding. So it's one of the entry points. Okay, so the idea is that I've got a bit string, time t equals zero, as you can see on the top row here. And uh, these bit strings occur in what's called a neighborhood. So this bit one has as a neighbor zero and zero. Uh, there is this function that allows me to change this bit into something else. And each of these bits will undergo this transition depending on the state of the neighbors. So that's the idea, okay? So the 1D bit string are the individuals for my complex system. I have a local transition function. Those are my interactions. And from the perspective of solid state physics, this is now a nearest neighbor interaction, but you look both to the right and to the left, not to the right, separately to the left. It's like a free body interaction, okay? Uh, and then I have a simultaneous global update to t equals one, that's the group behavior. Okay, so as I'm sure you can imagine, if you sort of um, play what you can do, uh, play with what you can do with this nearest neighbor rule in 1D, you get two to the two cubed uh, transition functions are 256. That's called the rule number in cellular automata. For example, rule 30, uh, which happens to be the random number simulator used by uh, Mathematica for integers, because Wolfram got his start in cellular automata and loves this subject, so you can look that up. Uh, you can sort of see where the rule numbers come from. This zero stays a zero. That zero flips to a one because its neighbor on the right is a one. 
And here are the um, you know, zero through seven, so eight possibilities. And then each of those has two possible outcomes. And so that gives you 256. Okay. So that's how you quantify the rule. Uh, that bottom row there in lighter blue, that, that's 30 in, in binary. Okay. So there are four basic classes of Slayer Automata. A great book to teach this out of um, is Downing's Think Complexity. It's a, it's a computer science book, but I actually use it with physicists and engineers, and I find it very effective. Uh, it's a nice book because it really clarifies these four classes of Slayer Automata with some simple examples any student can do in Python. Uh, type one would be kind of minimal dimension. This has dimension one, it's rule 56. I start by flipping a bit on the bottom and just propagates up to the left there. Okay, uh, type three would be a maximal dimension. It's that random number generator I just showed you. It's really filling the whole space, okay? Um, and uh, uh, type two would be fractal dimensions. Now that's filling sort of part of the space. This is a self-similar structure called uh, Sierpinski's triangle. It happens to have dimension 1.59. And if you'd like to talk about how to calculate this fractal dimension, we can talk about that at the end, but it's, it's really nice to have students do this kind of thing. That's rule 90. And then finally, very famously, rule 110 is Turing complete. That makes people very excited. So even if cellular time that don't reproduce all the physics, they do something else, right? Which is they present uh, very simple ideas of you know, Turing complete calculations. Um, so one outstanding question is, do quantum cellular automata present some kind of generalization of Turing complete notion? I see you're, you're preparing your difficult question question already from your wrinkling, wrinkling brow, this is a good sign. Okay, um, so, so I look forward to, to experts challenge me on these things. Um, the, the, the Turing complete piece uh, is yeah, something out in the literature, nothing I've proved, of course. Uh, the quantum piece, as so far as I know, is, is unproved, but there are many theoretical quantum computer scientists working on that problem right now. Okay, so what are quantum cellular automata? I'm going to take that well-known cellular automata idea and then generalize it to the quantum case, right? So we'll take bits as here on the one, we replace them with quantum bits, which is this sphere. I hope you can see it on the screen. This is this latitude and longitude between zero and one this surface. The transition function will become a double control unitary gate. A lot of these control gates involve one qubit to control that multiple unitary, which is simply a rotation on this block sphere. Um, but this will use to the right and to the left. So it's a double control, okay? Um, and, then, uh, and then there'll be a simultaneous global update. Now that can't be done in uh, in quantum mechanics, because quantum mechanics is time order. You can't do everything simultaneously. You have to do it in some order. Turns out these results are actually independent of the time ordering, which is pretty extraordinary. Okay. The case I'm going to show you for pedagogical reasons will be even odd site circuit layers, which is actually what we use it in, in the, the Google example on, on their Sycamore chip, but you, you can do lots of different sorts of orderings. Okay, so uh, Goldilocks QCA, what are those? Well, um, Goldilocks is going to involve um, some decisions about what we do based on the neighbors, okay? So we're gonna operate with a local unitary. This thing, uh, B hat, is gonna do something and it's gonna depend on the state of the nearest neighbors. That's the control control operation here. And so that's just a projector to one of these states, okay? And, uh, and then, you know, uh, this kind of coefficient will decide, you know, do, do we operate with this or not? So either we do nothing or we do an operation. Okay, so as I'm sure you can imagine, in this case with unitary operations, there aren't 256 rules. Many of those are non-unitary rules, or rules that involve losses, right, that are that irreversible. These are just the reversible rules of which there are 16 out of those 256. So T0 um, is trivial, that's just the identity. <laughs> so always static. Uh, T15, also trivial, always active, okay. Uh, but there are lots of things in between. For example, if we were to choose rule T13, it would involve high activity, broken symmetry, and as I'll show you, it produces essentially a random state. I would call that way too hot from the Goldilocks perspective. T1 happens to be what's called the PXP model. It's used in, in Reaper chains, which is a kind of quantum simulator that's very common now out there and has uh, you know, hundreds of qubits now. Um, and this PXP model is in fact a quantum cellular automata. It's static unless the neighbors are identically zero and zero. It doesn't do anything unless they're zero and zero. In which case it operates, that's a near Goldilocks rule. It's too cold, but it's definitely better than T13. Uh, T14, it's active unless the neighbors are one, one, too hot in the same way that T1 is too cold. There's something in the middle and that is called T6. It's active if and only if the neighbors are zero, one and one, zero. And now hopefully you see the symmetry. I have to have, you know, half spin up and half spin down in the neighborhood. Not only that, the results I'll show you today, I probably won't be time to tell you, but they extend to arbitrarily sized neighborhoods as far as we can tell. Which I think is quite exciting. So it really is about spin symmetries in the problem. So I'm glad people like that. Yeah. Okay, questions about this photo electrical before I show you some of what it does. 
Okay, so so it's 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 going to act. The local unitary will be somewhere on the block sphere. I'm going to use a Hadamard Hadamard gate, which means if I was at the pole, I would move down to the equator of the block sphere. Okay, it's a pretty simple one. Okay, um, so uh, I can start with initial condition. Of, for example, 19 qubits. I can flip, you know, one spin in the middle or one qubit in the middle, move it to one pole of the block sphere, and then I need some boundary conditions. My results are also independent of boundary conditions, at least qualitatively. Um, what I will uh, evolve is called a density matrix. A density matrix would be a pure system if it's just the outer product of these two quantum states. Um, in general, I will have a mixed subsystem in this uh, study that I'm doing now. And that mixed subsystem means that I do a partial trace over some part of the system to leave something mixed in the middle. Now, uh, the general audience may contain students who have never seen the partial trace. In my experience, uh, in linear algebra, the partial trace is not often taught. I want to encourage students that it is nothing more than shrinking the matrix, not all the way to a scalar, but just partly to a scalar. You take a big matrix and make it to a smaller matrix. That operation is something any undergraduate can learn in about an hour. It's no big deal. So if you haven't seen it before, that's all it is. Partial trace is one of the essential operations in quantum mechanics, and it happens all over here. That partial trace will produce this uh, mixed density matrix, and from here I will get my entries. Okay. So I'll have expectation values, and those expectation values uh, will be sort of the analog of getting a zero or a one. Um, and then I'll have a quantum entropy, which quantifies uh, how mixed that state is, how much information uh, you know, I'm lacking right? When, I'm, when I measure only part of the problem. So if we measure only in region A, you'll notice this is minus trace of rho sub A log base two rho sub A. So that looks like sum over I P log P, P sub I log P sub I, right? which is just the Shannon information, which any computer scientist knows. So this is just the quantum generalization of the Shannon information, except that you take P with one index, a vector, and you replace it with a matrix, this density matrix. Okay. The quantum mutual information is the object that we use to create my complex network. From there, I'll get my measures and we'll see what happens. Now, what is the quantum mutual information? Okay. So, uh, complex networks from quantum states. I want to emphasize what I'm doing here is I'm not actually creating a quantum network in the sense of the hypothetical quantum internet. This isn't about telling nodes who should talk to who. This is about the network that arises spontaneously in the state. Okay, so those are two different things in quantum mechanics. Another time, if you like, I have a whole talk I give on just that. Right, so the density matrix gives you um, a mixed state. I take a trace over all indices k not equal to j, and I will get a two by two matrix, rho sub j. That's a quantum state of the subsystem j. From there, I get a quantum entropy. This is called von Neumann entropy. Again, it's the generalization of Shannon information. Uh, Sj is minus trace rho j log rho j. It quantifies entanglement and it's non additive, which is very different from the kind of entropy you're used to. Um, so, quantum mutual information is about the uh, entropy incurred by, or the lack of information incurred by only measuring site j only measuring site K, and then simultaneously measuring J and K. What remains is only the connection between J and K, the mutual information, just those two sites, okay? So that's called the mutual information. It's, uh, it's one of the things you can show has sort of more in it than the classical example. And this is really, in my view, the best way to teach entanglement, but that's a whole other matter that it goes through we talk about. So this is a two-point quantum measure. So it involves non-locality. Um, it is bounded from below for, by all two-point correlators. So for those of you who may come from the phase transition world, I'm looking over at Thomas here, uh, you know, that there, there are people who, that, that, that's their bread and butter. Just keep in mind, it captures all the two-point correlators that would, you, you would use to characterize a phase transition. Okay. Um, so uh, if you read uh, uh, John Kreskel's writings, you know, you see he talks about the quantum book and he talks about how the full advantage to quantum computing is um, in correlations. And the correlations in the pages. You can have pages that are just random letters, right? But if you read the whole book at the same time, it's a beautiful novel, right? And that's part of what's going on in quantum mechanics, okay? So that's what we're doing here. We're sort of quantifying this with mutual information. So that gives me a two point measure, right? My mutual information. And from there, I can start to ask myself, what do I see with the system? Okay, so before I get into the complex network measures, I want to show you things that are perhaps more familiar to those of you that may have a physics background or may have thought about you know, a transport, very often engineering one thinks about transport. And so here's what happens uh, if I have uh, 19 qubits, okay? Time is running up this way and you will see this is short time and at the top is very long time, right up to 10,000. And then you see that I flip just one quantum bit at the bottom and I see how this propagates. Now here's the Goldilocks rule and you see that structure in terms of either spin 
or in this case, local entropy, will persist at very late times, right? If I look at T1, this model called PXP model that's been looked at a lot in experiments out there, you'll see that there's so little bit of structure at late times, but nothing like T6, okay? Uh, T14 and T13 completely thermalize. In fact, T13, which is truly symmetry breaking, thermalizes very, very fast. Now when I say thermalize, I mean approaches some sort of equilibrium. I won't gonna, I'm not gonna pretend that's exactly thermal equilibrium, but something like that, approaches equilibrium states. You see the same effects in the entropy, uh, and you can see that you know this entropy is totally flat as you go out. You just got what we call a, a volume wall in entropy. Okay, so what about complex networks? I showed you the spin, I showed you the entropy. Where are the complex networks? Well, here they are. Uh, you may be familiar with the GHC state, which is the Schrodinger cat. It's you know all the zeros plus all the ones, right? Those are your two options. Just those two, two states, it's called a GHC. And if you look at the complex network, it's not that interesting. It's pretty uniform. That's on the far left. On the far right, you see a random state, yeah, which would be close to what we call an Erdash Remy network. If you're familiar with complex networks, you can see T13 after some late times also produces something like a random state. T1 and 14 produce some significant deviation from either a random state or GHC, while T6 is quite structured, quite structured, right? It's got some dominant nodes. And that's what we look for in a small world network. Okay, so you see how the complex network structure produced. Uh, by these quantum cellular automata is really quite distinct if you use Goldilocks rules. Uh, I, I want to let you know that these mutual information networks are not something I invented out of nowhere. All I did is I was reading things on neuroscience because I have a lot of students of mine going in neuroscience and I, I got pointed to this review, uh, which came out in 2009, and these are the measures they use in the review on the brain. It's the same measures used on fMRI and EEG images to quantify the brain to tell the difference between someone thinking about a door and a window for great. <laughs> so pretty amazing that you can take such a simple idea and so effective in quantum mechanics. So interdisciplinarity is important in quantum. Yes. Can, can you, I'm just, I, I want some intuition. I, I'm not, this is not all that familiar to me. So sure. the, the connection between the, the points here, give me some intuition. About sure. That. So, so, so in, in, in complex networks, um, we have what are called uh, unweighted networks, which are just a zero or a one. You either have a link or you don't. And that would be like, um, you know, can I fly direct from Raleigh to DC? Well, yes, I'll do that later this afternoon. Can I fly direct from Raleigh to Shanghai? Probably not, right? I'm, I'm presuming not. So, okay. Um, but I may also have a weighted link. And the weighted link would say, well, if I go to DC, it takes me an hour. If I go to London, it takes me a lot more than an hour. So those are different weights, okay? And so here, this is called kind of a um, force action. So you can think of this as uh, masses and springs and the springs are representing the weight, right? And so that's why these networks rearrange themselves. So the reason that these are very circular on the left and the right is because the weights are relatively even. Here, the weights are very uneven. And then the thickness of the line also tells you the, the, the strength of the weight as a whole. Yeah, yeah, no problem, yeah. So, you know, complex networks are used, like probably the most common tool now in biology. They are used in physics, but more in statistical physics. And I presume they must come in systems engineering somewhere, but I don't think they're a dominant tool. Like when I go to systems engineering talks, it's not the first thing I see. Okay, any other questions? All right. So uh, what about complexity measures on Goldilocks quantum cellular automata from networks theory, okay? Uh, let's think about node strength. That's this kind of idea of everything eats everything, right? What's kind of the density of nodes as a whole. Um, what we're looking for here is something that's very kind of uh, power law, okay? So that would be typical small world networks. Power law means I have a few dominant nodes, you know, and I have lots of nodes with few connections, which about airports, you know, well, Raleigh's probably pretty connected, but from my neck of the woods back in Denver, certainly Santa Fe, it's not very connected, okay? But Denver Airport is, so I like to use those two examples. Um, so you can see, as you kind of move through these rule sets from a random up here, you know, down to Goldilocks, Goldilocks re looks really quite different in the node strength. And in fact, that node strength is showing that there are, you know, dominant, there, there are some, some uh, dominant nodes and they're, they're sitting out on the tail. These have high connectivity, and then there's lots of nodes with low connectivity. By the way, to clarify this as a log scale, Okay. Okay. So that's the first thing to notice. What about clustering? Well, if we look at clustering, clustering is one of the absolute characteristics um, that you see in social networks and other kinds of small world networks. And you can see that as a function of system size, this is now what I call planet size scaling that I'm doing, uh, only the uh, case of Goldilocks or T6 rule stays flat in clustering and very high. So that idea that you maintain high clustering as you grow in size, that's characteristic of small world networks. You notice all the other networks fall away. And then finally, we can talk about uh, disparity fluctuations, which is about rearrangements in the backbone of the system. And you see that it's, um, you know, uh, 
the Goldilocks rule that as a function of system size, you know, although it is slowly going away and we don't know what will happen when we get to thousands of nodes, we can do a finite size scaling prediction, but maybe not clear. Still, it is the network that remains the most dynamic. So persistent dynamics is one of the hallmarks of complex systems. By the way, you and I are persistent dynamics, right? If we were all thermalizing, we wouldn't be alive right now. Okay. So these are three examples of how these Goldilocks rules are different. So now Goldilocks quantum cell automata generate entropy fluctuations. And entropy fluctuations, if you go and you read um, this paper here by Costa in, in, in PRE, you'll see that those are one of the essential identifiers of um, persistent complexity in biological systems, what we call macro scale complexity. Um, and so uh, to quantify that, we look at the bond entropy. The bond entropy in a technical sense is the thing that you characterize sort of the complexity of, of quantum circuits under tensor network methods, which is kind of my area of specialization. And uh, so I was pretty happy that this bond entry showed up. Notice that I'm using the trace of row squared. That's called the second order rank entropy. It's also called a diversity measure in, uh, in economics and in biology. And it's the most common entropy you see out there besides the Shannon information. It's a very common measure. And if we look at entropy fluctuations, we'll see that again, even though the overall entropy is relatively low for the Goldilocks rule, that's the red one on the top plot there, audience out there, let me do this here, right? The fluctuations stay very high. So high fluctuations is again a hallmark of complexity for many fields. Okay, uh, so I'm looking at the time now, since I started a little late, okay, I think I have a little time. So uh, a lot of people, when I, when I show this, um, ask about, well, you know, how, how important is having a particular local unitary or a particular time ordering scheme? How specific is this quantum cellular atomic idea? What if my experiment's a little bit improved? Will it still work? And so I want to convince you that it will work under many, many, many different circumstances. It will always generate complexity, okay? So one example is I might choose not to go uh, just down to the equator of the block square. I may also rotate around the equator. So that I would call a phase rotation. Here's the additional phase rotation. In particular, I'm gonna show the clustering and you'll see that once again, the Goldilocks rule stays very high in clustering out to late times, unlike the other rules. The second thing I, I might look at are initial and boundary conditions. So I could look at fixed uh, zeros on the bounds. I could look at fixed ones on the bounds, or I could look at periodic boundary conditions. And I could look at, instead of just flipping a spin, doing a probabilistic flip of a spin, which is exactly what happens in a real experiment quantum mechanically, don't perfectly you know, go from zero to one, right? You get close, but you will have some deviation from that. So what happens? And you'll see that there are cases where, for example, the PXP rule, uh, T1 will be a little higher, but as a whole, the Goldilocks rule, by the way, on this seven order magnitude log scale, is still saying, staying much higher than any of the other rules, sort of under all of these conditions. Okay, now solving exactly what happens around these symmetry points um, for particular cases, that, that's in, under different boundary conditions, that's a really nice analytical problem that I think is trackable, but I have not done it. So these, these are going to have the results for the moment. So this is also subject for future research, but I think it shows that overall these Goldilocks rules tend to be the most complex. Okay, um, what if we run this in continuous time? I mentioned quantum simulators earlier. Quantum computers are fairly working, fairly working. They're very exciting. I'm gonna show you results from a digital quantum computer in a minute, but it was very hard. It took me like, you know, well over a year and a lot of fine tuning, a lot of working with experimentalists, like an entire team of, you know, one of the wealthiest companies in the world. What about quantum simulators, which a lot of people make, you know, in their, their labs, in normal physics departments, you know? Uh, so that would be in continuous time. So it turns out if you run this thing continuous time, you'll see, uh, you can kind of generalize the idea, uh, you know, with uh, Hamiltonian acting over some local Hamiltonians, you know, where you have some kind of local operation that occurs, um, you know, with some projectors and, and I'll give you the same idea, right? And guess what? Here's the analog simulation, here's the digital simulation. So they are very similar, okay? And in fact, you can show all these signatures for system complexity happen in the analog case as well. So we know it doesn't depend on the local unitary. I didn't show you this, but we know it doesn't depend on time ordering. We know, we know overall it doesn't depend on boundary conditions or on initial conditions, as long as the initial condition is non-trivial. And it does not depend on whether you run it in analog or digital, that is to say discrete or continuous time. That's amazingly persistent complexity. Under all of these conditions, complexity is persistent. Okay. So finally, we might say, well, what happens if we work not just with nearest neighbors, but as we do in many different solid state systems, we work with next nearest neighbors. For example, we have frustration and we often break it with next nearest neighbors. So what if we have a five site uh, neighborhood? Well, uh, 
the number of rules. This is an exponentiated, exponentiated process. So suddenly we have 6.5 times 10 to the four rules. So I'm not gonna look at all of those, that would take a while. But what I will do is look at the uh, 32 totalistic rules. That is say rules that conserve the total number of, uh, the, sorry, the rules that are symmetric, well, not symmetric, the rules that depend only on the total number of spins in the neighborhood. Because I'm interested in the Goldilocks rule, which says I should have a 50-50 mix, I'll look at all possible mixes of number of spins in the neighborhood. That's how I think about it. So these totalistic rules, um, as I say, there are 32 of them, you know, many of them just thermalize like before. This rule, uh, F4, is one of a couple of Goldilocks rules you might think about. And in fact, it generates um, the first truly quantum entangled solid which I think is pretty cool. So I, I spent a lot of my life on solitons. Uh, for those of you who don't know what soliton is, it, it's, uh, it's like a tidal wave. It's a localized excitation that persists through time. And it's very particle-like. It's a particle-like excitation of a wave. It's also to uh, you know, simple nonlinear equations like what uh, you know, sine functions are to linear equations, right? So sort of the basic mathematical form usually looks like a set, okay? So this is what's called a breather. And when you um, run these things in discrete systems, uh, uh, classically, in classical waves, you know, you'll find that you get these kind of breathers. Uh, and here's, here's a waveguide array. This is an actual classical system, optical. And here is a quantum tangled, you know, uh, a prediction for running on a quantum computer to see the same kind of thing. I think that's pretty amazing. So there are a lot of emergent features in these systems yet to be found. This is an example, another hallmark of complexity. Okay, so finally, the experiment. So I, I need a little water before we get into what we do with Google. All right. Actually, may I ask a question? Yeah, please, uh, and so, I, can, I can go back here. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Actually, probably not particularly to this slide. Sure. So my question is, um, so for me, uh, I'm kind of more familiar with uh, this, uh, you know, kind of like the gate model of the quantum computer. <coughs> So I'm just trying to make the connection between this uh, quantum cellular automata with uh, the, the, the gate model. So the way I see it, as you have shown is that uh, when I have your model, I have kind of like the one gate connecting, uh, you know, two adjacent qubits, and then the one layer co covering probably, you know, one type of connection and then another layer covers up the other. So I'm just curious, kind of like, you know, what exactly is the connection of, you know, maybe I'm getting lost a little bit over there. Sure, and I'll, I'll show you that circuit in a minute if you like. Um, yeah, that's great. Yeah. yeah, but it's, you know, it's, it's a controlled, controlled Hadamard gate, right? So it's a Hadamard that depends on having a zero or a one in, you know, to the right, and then also to the left. So you have to compound the circuit. So each right. time step has 12 or 16 layers, depending on how you, uh, you know, compactify the circuit, and part of the trick with Google is to get it, you know, down to 12. So, but um, uh, there are many other tricks to make the actual quantum calculation work. And uh, maybe at the end, like I can mention some of those if you're interested in technical details or, or when we meet. Um, okay, there's something called K calibration we do. And, I mean, there are many, many, many things you have to do actually, and you have to do post selection, which we'll talk about later. So, but as far as the actual quantum circuit, um, you know, it's even sites and then odd sites. So, first, all of the even sites, you look at the neighbors. And you, and you do this operation or don't do it, depending on the state of the neighbors, that's the control control. And then you do all the odd sites and just switch even on. Right? Yeah, and then you, you, when you talk about like this uh, like five connection type of thing, so that basically increases the, the kind of like the, the number of neighboring qubits that can Correct. influence the target, right? Correct, and that has so many circuit layers that we can't do that with Google's quantum computer right now. We'd have to go to trap ions or wait until superconducting systems right. have higher fidelity or you know, longer T1 times. Okay, and that's yeah. it. Okay. Um, Thank okay. you. Great. More questions? All right. Well, let's get into. Yes. I'm wondering if the question is so here's one of Tom's favorite cellular automata, but I heard that was called 110 or something. 110, the Turing. Yes. So is there an analog of this with the quantum cellular automata system that realizes the most general survey case model or specific case model? Open question. But people like Hastings are working on this, and you can see some very serious papers out there um, looking at the computational complexity of quantum cellular automata and the classifications of generic quantum cellular automata. I, those are great papers, and I, I like to read them, bounce off them. I think it's, ha however, quite important to try to actually make them. <laughs> As we all know, we can theorize about computers all day, but we actually start coding that's when we figure out how they work. So I'm sort of on the figure out how they work part. Um, but I hope that the work that I'll show you now will come back and influence those, those groups that are floating around. Yeah, great question. Okay. So 
what happens when you run the experiment? Well, um, I want to show you the first. Uh, I, I, it would be nice if I made the slides come up one, one at a time, because this is what happens when you have a beautiful quantum computer and you just do the raw data. It's just it's just a wash, okay? <laughs> and I mean, this is what is this one of the best quantum computers in the world right right now? Digital quantum computer. So so what do you do when when this is your emulated prediction? And when I say emulated, I mean I'm emulating it with noise, okay? So I'm putting noise in the problem, right? Uh, using quantum trajectories. So I won't go into that because it would take too long, but you know, it involves uh, averaging over lots of different possible, uh, you know, dephasing events and you know, loss events and whatnot. And so, um, so, so it's it's a uh, uh, random polar polarized noise. Okay. Uh, so this is the emulated case. That's what you get <laughs> when you just run the simulation. You know, and it's sort of upset because you think, well, you know, all this time, all these expensive quantum computers. What can I do? Well, the answer in the short term is post selection. Now, post selection is a short-term solution. Uh, Post-selection is, again, I think you'll find this quite interesting. I'm, I'm speaking to my math colleague here for the general audience when I'm saying you, because he, he very much loves symmetries. Post-selection says I'm going to select on a certain value of conservation law, okay? You know, which should hold under, you know, uh, propagation without noise, but noise is breaking that conservation law. So in this case, it's the number of domain walls. Okay, so number of domain walls is like, I have a bunch of zeros and I have a bunch of ones and I'm holding my fingers as if they're spins because magnetism is exactly how we think about it. And the wall between the zeros and the ones is called the main wall. So it's where you go from zero to one, okay? So if you post-select on keeping that number conserved, right, then you get this pretty decent image out of the end. And, and you know, for early experiments, this is great. And you can see it's much better than the raw case, okay? If I wanted to actually look at you know, how the data progresses, time step to time step, it would be in this long series of images. That's what we actually get out of the experiment. And then you put those together uh, and, you know, that out comes this, this beautiful set of looking at the local population. Now, local population is just projections on zeros and ones on average, okay? And so we could say, well, uh, you know, what happens to all the quantum measures in the problem that we're interested in, in particular, the complexity measures? Okay, so uh, I'm going to use the clustering, which is the thing that I showed you over and over. Again, the clustering is, is the, Friend of my friend, also my friend, right? The number of closed triangles over the total number of possible triangles. So that is one of the key uh, identifiers of complex networks. You don't see that in a random network. Uh, you can cluster into love in a random network. You certainly don't see that in any interesting way at all. In a lattice, you notice something about complexity, okay? And so what you see is uh, the emulated part is the blue. You see clustering stays high. Uh, if you look at the raw data, it just you know, bottoms out right away. But if you look at post-election, there is this coherence window. And now here's the truth about quantum computing. Everything I can do is in here in that little window. <laughs> that, that's what I get for this number of nines in Google's quantum computer, one of the top quantum computers in the world. So, you know, quantum computing is just starting to work. I've got just enough of a coherence window to be able to do things. Each of these QCI cycles has many circuit layers underneath it. Like I say, 12 to 16 layers, depending on how I formulate it. And so actually this is going vastly longer than random states. So already you should know, I told you random states was 20 circuit layers, right? Uh, I get very high numbers of circuit layers, you know, hundreds, okay? So that's already something that's very interesting about quantum cellular automata. You see that I do have this coherence window to work in, and this window I can ask what happens. Now, the only thing is, when I post-select uh, a random state, I'm saying I'm going to take all possible numbers of domain walls, and I'll pick out only the outcomes that have a fixed number of domain walls. That's an extreme bias. I bias my answer. So I can't compare, you know, quantum cellular autonomy post select to random state. That's not fair, right? That's the wrong calibration. I have to compare post selected quantum cellular automata to a post selected random state. Okay, that's what I'm going to do. So a post selected random state would be like, well, I have white noise but I'm gonna throw out you know, anything that has the wrong pattern of singular values and all my realizations of white noise, of course it will come out of something that has more structure than usual white noise. That's the same kind of idea. Okay, so here's what happens. So this is the last set of plots I'm gonna show you, and then I'm gonna close. So uh, bear with me, because this will involve some explaining. Okay, so uh, I have here clustering, I have um, path length, so I mentioned path length and small world networks, and then I have the probability density uh, over node strength, and that's something about the small world nature of the problem and having hubs, okay? So the, uh, the dashed line is the right thing to compare it to. So the red, the red measured lines or uh, data points would be raw data. So those look very low. And you'd think uh, from the green, you know, post-selected quantum serotonin, well, matches the emulated case, 
And look how amazing that is. And quantum stereotype, I completely dominate over these, <laughs> these random states. But in fact, if you post-select random states, you do get some clustering, okay? That's this line. I, I can calculate that analytically, okay? And uh, here's the actual path length. The path length is quite, quite low still. And then here you see you do get an ex a slightly extended region, right, of, um, of node strength, you know, where you have a diff different numbers of, of connected, you have nodes that have different numbers of connections. So, you know, what, what it looks like is, you know, at the end of the day, um, the kind of small worldness that comes through the bias introduced by post selection onto random states gets much, much bigger for quantum cellular automata, and the clustering also gets bigger. So quantum cellular automata are growing that. And in fact, down at the bottom, you can see the kinds of complex networks that I was just uh, asked about a minute by your colleague who had to run teach a class. Um, and you'll see that, okay, here's the emulated kind of network I would expect. Here's the, the raw data, you know, it's almost random, <laughs> right? Um, here is the post-selected and here's the random post-selected. So it's not enough to just, you know, look at these pictures. You have to really get into these particular measures of complexity. Complexity is not one number. It's not like algorithmic complexity where you just, maybe you have one number you try to put on everything. In fact, it's a number of physical features, similar to chaos. Chaos is not one thing. It's not just the Appanet exponent, it's a number of physical features to identify chaos. Same with complexity. Okay, so this is the very first experiment on quantum cellular automata. At least under the constraints of post selection, it does demonstrate the emergence of complexity. And very importantly, I'll go back one slide here, uh, you'll notice that the end time of this coherence window is always around uh, cycle 12. That's where the green line comes back down to that flat background, that black dash line. Okay, uh, that is independent of the number of qubits. I've discussed this with a number of people in, in individual meetings. This was a total shock to Google experimentalists, right? And it's still something we'd like to demonstrate without post selection. But what it says is, I don't care about the total number of operations. I don't care about the volume. I only care, right, about the number of circuit layers. That's totally different from random states. That's totally different from the expectations of experimentalists, which is the more operations you do, the worse things get. That's not true here. That says that quantum cellular automata are doing some kind of self-correction. Understanding this thoroughly is an open problem, and it may present a resource for error correction. There are many people thinking about that right now. All right, uh, with that, I'm gonna conclude. Uh, so uh, first of all, uh, I showed you a nice picture of the generalization of elementary cellular automata, something that's often taught to high school students to inspire them to code. Uh, and this is a generalization where we look at, for example, both um, you know, uh, spin and entropy. I'm showing spin here. Uh, there is a Goldilocks rule, which I would call just right. That's this rule T6. And here's something that, um, you know, is, is equilibrating uh, and, and does not maintain complexity. Okay. So QCA are simple, one-dimensional system. They involve uh, some individuals, quantum bits, right? Some interaction, which is a control control gate, local unitary, and then some uh, emergent behavior, and that comes through the time sequence. Goldilocks quantum serotonin rules balance activity with stasis, and they ask that I have the same uh, fixed number of spins in the neighborhood, and they're kind of just right. They generate this persistent complexity. They, rely, they reliably generate robust physical complexity, which is independent of the number of qubits, which means it only depends on the, 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 the circuit depth, but not on the total number of operations. Okay. Um, this uh, paper was published in, in QST. Uh, uh, quantum science and technology, IOP journal. Uh, and um, our latest result is to show this in real world quantum circuits. I gave you a little preview at the end of this talk, and that is now under review of major communications, and I think hopefully on the last stage of review, we hope. And uh, uh, with that, I will end and take any questions from the audience. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you Lincoln. That was really a fascinating talk. Um, am I correct that the way you implement this uh, is, is you, you set up the circuit, go one layer, measure it, and then you put two layers, you measure that. Three layers, you measure that, and then you concatenate these to create these. Correct. That's, that's it. Yeah, and, yeah. and to remind the general audience, you know, the difference between quantum and classical, one of the main differences between quantum and classical computations is if I want to give this PowerPoint presentation, I only have to give it once, right? But in quantum mechanics, I have to give it, you know, a thousand or ten thousand or hundred thousand times, and then average over the results and look at the distribution. And and so so quantum, there's a lot of overhead in quantum. So there's overhead for each of those time steps with you know uh, hundred thousand measurements actually, and then you have you have to go to different times. So you know that's why these things take a while. Yeah. 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 yeah.
I'm curious if there is a parallel to Fontoro's uh, one project, there's essentially uh, different types. Uh, if you can look at the amount of entanglement, the amount of fluids um, that are being used, and then come up with a similar approach to at least about um, um, basically coherence, because that's what you're doing. Yeah. Do, do you see anything? I mean, if I gave you basically uh, 20 different, um, uh, I mean, just spark the surface, it was maybe this pattern of different ones, and um, that you were trying to find um, metrics to basically look at uh, decoherence and uh, if the, the um, dependence on number of fluids versus uh, surface size. I'm, I'm going to give you a slightly long answer, but that's okay. That's fine. I'm going to start with an analogy. Uh, in entangled many body systems, which is what ultimately this is, what we call entangled quantum dynamics, uh, there's the idea that, that you know, all entangled quantum dynamics falls into two camps. We call an area law, where the entropy grows with just you know, the boundaries, and a volume law, where the, the entropy grows with you know, the total number of qubits. Right? This demonstrates pretty clearly there's something in between. And I have a whole other paper I'm going to put out on that. I think the distinguishing of things into volume or area law is too extreme. Those are actually two extremes of a, of a continuum of possibilities that's quite interesting. Fault tolerant quantum computing, I would say the same thing. So fault tolerant quantum computing would be, you know, I really don't care about a whole class of errors. You know, my system's completely impervious to those errors. That's not true here. It's just, you know, more robust with respect to those errors. So I think what this is showing is that there are a number of things on the way to fault tolerant quantum computing that will allow some relative robustness that do not be absolute criteria of all time quantum computing. I like that idea. I, I've made a living out of um, showing unstable solutions in physical systems that mathematicians wouldn't care about, but in fact last longer than the experiment. That's like vortices and those condensates. Uh, so, you know, of all of those things that decay and go away. Uh, however, they, they stay around long in the lifetime of the experiment with enormous dynamics. You can make a Birkenstock lattices of vortices. So, that sort of idea of these, you know, mathematically. Uh, a little less pretty, but physically practical, right? you know, methods, calculations, perspective, that, that's something I enjoy. I, I suspect that's true of fault tolerant quantum computing. So I would call that an open research topic, and this is, would be a great subject for an ASCII program. Yeah. Great question. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure whether this is a, a, a reasonable question to ask or not, but anyway. Uh, with this uh, QCA model, so in terms of uh, carrying out some computation tasks, so for example, like a, a two qubit uh, logical and operation, for example, so how should I map this kind of computation task into the QCA model? Is there a, you know, is that a fair question or it's all wrong? Yeah. So, you know, if, if indeed this is, you know, this is some generalization in turn complete, then I should be able to, you know, map arbitrary quantum operations into this right. problem that hasn't been solved. Uh, I think that that was uh, that was looked at a lot for, for um, easy model uh, in particular, but with uh, generalized links um, because of quantum annealing early on by a group at Google before they got into actually building quantum computers and doing this model. Um, so there are groups that are specializing in questions like that. I don't know of any specializing in this problem, although they're probably out there and they're probably going to contact me if this ends up on the internet and be like, hey, why didn't you mention this? And then I'll just write it with their name. So, but it seems a completely reasonable question to ask. I think having now demonstrated that quantum serotonin are realizable in experiments and, and you know, quite reasonable objects and quite robust, um, I think people are now willing to do this. I have to say, it took me five years to get experimentalists to try this because many experiments said it won't work, it can't be true. And even with Google, it was a year of going out there and giving talks and, hey, we're gonna have this effect where, you know, this problem will be independent of the number of qubits. They said, it can't be true, it can't be true. You know, and, and in fact, it is at least up to the limits of post-selection. So uh, experimentalists are wary. These machines are very expensive. <laughs> so it's a good time for theorists to jump in or computer scientists to jump in and, uh, and try to address those questions. And that, that's, that's in my view, that's actually the most important one, even more than error correction, is you know, can we use quantum serotonin to do arbitrary computation? If we can, then they're incredibly promising. If not, then they're much more limited, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks. that's the right question to ask. Yeah, I have a related question. Uh, yes. You mentioned already that they are somehow correcting themselves. Yes. Can we use the QCA or a piece of it to do error correction as part of another? Yeah, many, many people think about that. No answer yet. So there's a lot of hope. <laughs> so I don't think anyone's worked that out.
Thanks for all the great questions. We, there is some time pressure. I know we're over a little bit. So let's thank our speaker one more time. Yeah, I was talking. Anyone want to ask me a hard question once the recording is off? Yeah. <laughs>